In this video, I'm going to review AP Pre-Calculus topics from Unit 3, Part 1, which covers the topics 3, 1 through 3, 7, uh, primarily talking about sine and cosine, their values and their graphs. So when we get to sine and cosine graphs, we'll talk about our period, uh, but you can have a periodic graph that's not necessarily sine or cosine. Uh, so from these graphs, we're going to identify the period. So the period is the time it takes to complete one full cycle. Uh, so what you want to be able to do is identify where you have a start. Start's not a great word, but you can go from a maximum to a maximum, a mid to a min, a minimum to a minimum. Uh, in this case, we're going 2 pi to complete that cycle. Here, if I start there through that cycle, that one's going to be pi. According to this graph, I have a period of 2. And then this funny looking guy, uh, I have a maximum here. We go back down and it repeats itself in 0 0.5. Okay. Next, I have a graph of a periodic function and one period is shown. Okay, so this has starts at 0, ends at 6. So we have a period of six. So we're gonna match uh, four different statements to uh, different ranges. Uh, so the graph is increasing concave up, increasing concave down, decreasing concave up, decreasing concave down, which is absolutely easy when we've got the graph in front of us, right? Uh, so 1.5 to three, there's 1.5 to three. My graph is decreasing and concave up. So that's C for my options here. 15 to 16.5. Well, that's not on my graph, which is a little, little bit trickier. But when something's periodic, we know one period away, the same thing's happening. So what's happening at 0 is going to happen at 6, is going to happen at 12, is going to happen at 18, and so on. Uh, so what I want to do is either add or subtract uh, various amounts of periods to be able to arrive at something that I can see. Um, so if my period is 6, I can subtract two periods from each of these values. And arrive at something that we can calculate. Well, that's 12. 15 minus 12 is 3. 16.5 minus 12 is 4.5. So what's happening on 15 to 16.5 is the same as what's happening from 3 to 4.5, which in this case is increasing and concave up. Okay, 24 to 25.5. I'm going to go ahead and subtract 4 periods of 6. Okay, which means I'm subtracting 24. So if I subtract 24 from 24, we get 0. 24 from 25.5 is 1.5. So back to my graph on 0 to 1.5, our graph is decreasing and concave down. Okay, we have the same whether it's positive or negative. So I can subtract periods, uh, or in this case, I'm going to add some periods, uh, specifically two periods. So I'm going to add 12 to both of these which will give me 4.5 and 6. If I added 1, I'd still be a negative, which you could probably work it out. Uh, but this last little bit here is increasing and concave down. Okay, next, I have a periodic function, and I'm representing it using a table. Okay, so I've got random numbers, uh, but I know that my period is 7 from this statement. f of x equals f of x plus 7 means that if I add 7 to it, the same thing's going to happen. Uh, so this is uh, okay. uh, so whatever's happening at 1, 7 units away is going to happen again. Now I'm looking at this and I made a little mistake because negative 1 should behave the same as 6. So we're just going to ignore that from being in my table and pretend uh, it didn't exist. Um, anyway, 
So what I can do is I can either add or subtract multiples of 7 to arrive at values that are not in my chart. Uh, so here I can just subtract 7 to get f of 4, which is in my chart, and I have a 7. Okay, here I can subtract 3 periods of 7, or 21, which would make this equal to f of 2. which isn't in my chart. Thought it might be, it's not, but f of two is gonna equal the same as f of nine, because I can go forward seven, so I get three. So I guess I could have started by just subtracting 14. Uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, here I'm going to add 21, which will make this equal to f of negative one, which is negative two. And then 38, uh, I can subtract 35, which would be five periods to get f of three, and f of three is five. Next we get into sine, cosine, and tangent. Uh, so we have a circle with a radius of 10. The angle theta is in standard position, and we're gonna find the sine of theta, cosine theta, tangent of theta. Before we do that, let's review our definitions for sine, cosine, and tangent. So if an angle is in standard position, means its initial side is on the positive x-axis and its terminal side is somewhere else, the sine is going to be y over r, r being the radius of the circle. Cosine is going to be x over r. And tangent is going to be y over x. So for this angle theta, we have our terminal point at 6, negative 8 on a radius circle with a radius of 10. So my sine is going to be the y over r, which will be negative 8 over 10, or negative 4 fifths. Cosine is going to be 6 over 10, which is 3 fifths. And my tangent is going to be y over x, which will be negative 8 over 6 or negative four-thirds. Angle theta is in standard position. The measure of theta is pi over two radians. If angle theta subtends a circle with a radius of 10, what is the measure of the subtended minor arc? So let's break this down. Radians is equal to the arc length divided by the radius. Well, in this scenario, I have the radian measure, and I have the radius. What I'm solving for is my arc length, which I'm just going to write as a. Well, to solve for a, I'll multiply both sides by 10, which will be 5 pi equals a, and that's my arc length. Next, we're going to be finding very specific values for sine and cosine. Uh, and the tool we're going to use for this is something called the unit circle. Okay. The unit circle gives us specific angles. Um, this has degrees and radians. You're only responsible for radians. Uh, but it gives the different radian measures from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, and then it gives us uh, the different coordinates. So my x value here is going to be the cosine. The sine is going to be our y value. Um, so things that we want to notice, because we're not actually going to have a unit circle um, on the test or on our AP exam. So we need to just know this. Uh, so we've got our quadrantal, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. Halfway between those are my pi over 4s. So pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. The two angles closest to the, well, four angles closest to the x-axis those are our pi over 6. This distance is pi over 6. So this is pi over 6. This is pi minus pi over 6, which would be 5 pi. This is pi over 6 plus pi over 6. Sorry, pi plus pi over 6, which is 7 pi over 6. Uh, and then 1 away from 2 pi is 11 pi over 6. And then the ones closest to the y-axis have our denominators of 3. This is pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3, 
4 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. The ones with the same denominators have the same coordinates, save the signs based on the quadrant. So my 4s always have an x and a y value of root 2 over 2. It just depends positive and negative in each quadrant. Obviously, the quadrantals are out one unit just in which direction. Then these coordinates, root 3 over 2, 1 half, and 1 half root 3 over 2, how I like to think about it is you have either a short, a long x short y, like we do for the pi over, pi over 6, or you have a short x long y. And the long is root 3 over 2, and the short is 1 half. So we need to be able to visualize where we're on the R on the unit circle and then the corresponding points. So we're going to be finding these values by thinking through it. Um, so to help me, I'm just going to sketch some little circles. Okay. So we're looking at where we're at. So 3 pi over 4 is my halfway one in my second quadrant. We're looking for the y value there, which is going to be root 2 over 2. Okay, cosine of pi over 6. So pi over 6 is the one that's closest to the x-axis. And we want the y value there, which is the short segment. Sorry, the x, which is going to be root 3 over 2. Long x, short y. Sine of pi. Pi is over here. Y value there is 0. 0. X value there is 1. 3 pi over 2. Down there, y value is negative 1. Pi over 4 in the first quadrant is going to be a positive root 2 over 2. 7 pi over 6, so that's the one closest to the x-axis. We want the y value there, so long x, short y, but negative, so negative 1 half. 5 pi over 3, that's going to be the measure closer to the y-axis, so we have a short x, long y. We want the x, so we want the 1 half, and it's going to be positive. 2 pi over 3, that's going to be closest to the y-axis. Short x, long y, which is positive, root 3 over 2. Okay. Next, given an angle in standard position and the radius of the circle, find the coordinates of the intersections of the circle and the terminal ray. The formulas we're going to use for that, the x-coordinate is going to be our cosine theta, y is going to be our sine theta. So x still goes with y, or sorry, x still goes with cosine, y still goes with sine. Okay. So we have a theta of 5 pi over 3 and an r of 10. So my coordinates are going to be 10 cosine 5 pi over 3, 10 sine 5 pi over 3. Then we need to use our unit circle to evaluate those. Okay, 5 pi over 3 is the 3 closest to our y-axis. So I have a short x, long y. A positive short x of 1 half. A negative long y of root 3 over 2. So when I multiply those, I'll get 5 and negative 5 root 3. Here we've got 21 cosine 3 pi over 4, 21 sine 3 pi over 4. Okay, in the second quadrant at 3 pi over 4, our x and y are both root 2 over 2, except for the x value or a cosine is negative. Our y will be positive, though. So this final will be negative 21 root 2 over 2, positive 21 root 2 over 2. Okay, 3 pi over 2 down at the bottom. Okay, so at the, at here, my x value is 0, so 5 times 0 is 0, and my y value is a negative 1. 
that'll be negative 5. And if you just think about it, if I have a radius of 5 and I'm trying to find that point, it's going to be 0, negative 5. Next, we're going to go backwards, and we're going from a coordinate, and we want to find the r and the theta. There's different ways you can do this. Uh, you can use, when we get to tangent, we'll have some other strategies. But for right now, uh, I'm just looking at this here. It has a negative x, positive y, so we're in the second quadrant, and we have a long x, short y. Okay, that means my theta is going to be... 5 pi over 6. Okay, the coordinates there for 5 pi over 6 would be negative root 3 over 2, positive 1 half. So to go from here to here, I need to multiply by 4. Okay, this one is a root or a third quadrant. Okay, so that's going to be like the point, so our theta is 5 pi over 4. My r, in case you can't see it, my coordinates were negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. So to get 7s, my r is 7. And then lastly, negative 2, 0. It's going to be right there. My r is going to be pi. My theta is going to be Next, we have the graph of cosine of theta. Uh, then we're going to determine on each interval whether our graph is increasing, decreasing, or concave up and concave down. So let's graph cosine. So the graph of cosine, and we're going to talk about these attributes a little bit more. Uh, the amplitude is 1, and the period is 2 pi. Cosine starts at the maximum and oscillates from its maximum down to its minimum to its maximum. Okay, so on each of these intervals, we've got some increasing, some decreasing, some concave up, and some concave down. From 0 to pi over 2, okay, we are decreasing, concave down. Just abbreviate here. From pi over 2 to pi, we're still decreasing, but my graph is now concave up. From pi to 3 pi over 2, we're increasing and concave up. And finally, we are increasing but concave down. Okay. Now we have some graphs, and we're going to identify four pieces of information. The period, the amplitude, the frequency, and the midline. Okay, period we've already talked about. Period is how long it takes to complete one cycle. So for this one, it's taking eight. Frequency is the reciprocal of period one eighth. Amplitude is the distance from the midline to the max or the min. So I'm actually going to find the midline first, which is three. And the amplitude is how far from my max or my min we are from that midline. So this is going to be two. Here, my period is pi over 2, which makes the frequency 2 over pi. The midline for this one is at negative 1, which makes the amplitude 3 above and below that. Uh, the sinusoidal function g has a minimum at the point 0, negative 3, the first maximum after reaching the minimum, occurs at pi over 3, 7. And we're going to find those same four things, uh, which is a whole lot easier if you have a graph. So I have a minimum at 0, negative 3, and a maximum at pi over 3, 7. So my graph's going to go up to here, and then it's going to come back down. Okay, if it takes 1 pi over 3 to get from here to here, it's going to take 2 pi over 3 to re go through that full cycle. So my period is going to be 2 pi over 3. Frequency then is 3 over 2 pi. My midline, 
Okay, you can figure it out, but I like to find the midline by, it's the average of the max and the min. So if I add seven and negative three and divide that by two, we're gonna get four over two, which is at two. For the amplitude, again, multiple ways to do this. Uh, the amplitude is gonna be the average, sorry, not the amplitude, uh, is gonna be the half of the distance from the max and the min. So if the distance from seven and negative three is 10, my amplitude is gonna be five. Um, alternatively, we know this is two, so from two to seven is five, and from two to negative three is five. However you arrive at that answer, that's just how you think about things. Same question, different points. My first minimum is at negative pi over four, 10, and then the maximum is pi over four, 26. So I'm gonna sketch a picture. So I have my minimum at negative pi over four, 10, and my maximum here. Well, my period is gonna be double what I have here. So from here to here is pi over two. So my full period is gonna be pi. The frequency then is one over pi. My midline is gonna be the average of 10 and 26, which will be 18. My amplitude is gonna be half of the distance. So 26 minus 10 over two, or I can just say that's 16 over two. So my amplitude is gonna be eight. Next, I have a graph, and we're going to be writing an equation in the form a sine b theta plus d. So my characteristics, the a, or absolute value of a, is going to give me my amplitude. My period is going to be 2 pi divided by b, because the period of sine or cosine is 2 pi. This b is a horizontal dilation by the factor of one over b. So we'll be dividing by b to get our period. And d is gonna be my vertical shift or my midline. Okay, so for my first graph here, I have, draw my midline in here. You can find these attributes in whatever order you want to. I like to find the amplitude first. So that's gonna go from two to six, which is four, which means my A is gonna be four. My period is eight pi. Okay, so if my period is two pi over B, my B is two pi over the period. And then my vertical shift or my midline is at y equals 2, which means my d equals 2. So this one's going to be 4 sine 1 fourth theta, close parentheses, plus 2. Okay, it was a positive sign since it started at midline and went up. Had it gone down, then we would have made this a negative. Um, but we did need to write it as a sign as that's how it was presented to us here. Okay, let's repeat that for this one. My amplitude, we're going three up and three down. So my A is three. The period is two, which means my B is two pi divided by two or pi. And then my vertical shift or my midline is going to be y equals 2, so my d is 2. So the equation here is again a positive, positive 3 sine pi theta plus 2. Okay, next I have a couple of sinusoidal functions. Uh, and we're going to identify the amplitude, the period, the phase shift, and the vertical shift. All right, so let's review the general equations. 
So I've got the general equation, a sine b in parentheses theta plus c, close parentheses plus d, and the same with cosine. The amplitude, again, is going to be the absolute value of whatever our a is. It could be positive or negative, but amplitude is a distance. Period is 2 pi over b. The phase shift, when it is in this factored form, is going to be negative c. Okay, if the, this was a plus pi over 2, that means my phase shift is negative pi over 2, and I'm physically going to move it to the left pi over 2. If this is a minus, then we're going to be moving it to the right, just like any of our translations. A vertical shift is always going to be whatever that d value is. So now let's take that information from our equations. Given this equation, my amplitude is going to be 3. My period is going to be 2 pi divided by 1 fourth, which will be 8 pi. My phase shift is a negative pi. And my vertical shift is 5. Amplitude 4.5. Period is 2 pi over 3 pi. And if it's not the factored form like this, then you're going to need to factor it so that the theta is by itself, so you can see that phase shift. Uh, but it is factored for us, so my phase shift is a positive 2. My vertical shift is a negative 17. Okay, I've got a similar problem to before, but we're actually going to be writing the equations this time. Uh, so I'm going to draw myself a picture. We have a minimum at 0, negative 3 and a maximum at pi over 4, 13. Okay. So my period is going to be, if this is pi over 4, another pi over 4 makes our period pi over 2, which means my b is 2 pi divided by pi over 2. or 4. My amplitude. Okay, the amplitude goes, so we're going from 13 to negative 3. So that's a span of 16. Half of that's going to be 8. My midline is going to be the average of 13 and negative 3. So if I add 13 and negative 3, that's 10. Divided by 2 is 5, or I can go from this up 8 to 5, or from down thir from 13 down 8 to get 5. And we're writing this with no phase shift, which means we need to pick the appropriate trig function to make that happen. Okay, this is crossing at the y-axis at its minimum, and that will be accomplished with a negative cosine. If it starts at the maximum, it would be a cosine. Starts at the midline going up, sine, midline going down, cosine. So putting all this together, we'll have a negative. My amplitude is 8, so my A is 8. Cosine, 4 theta plus 5. I talked about this, so let's get this in front of us. Um, these are what I consider to be the four parent graphs because, you know, we want negatives and positives. So sine starts at the midline and goes up, then back down. Cosine starts at the maximum. Uh, negative sine, that graph upside down, starts at the midline, goes down. This one starts at the minimum, goes up. Now we have phase shifts, which can take this and move it to the left or to the right. Um, and that's what we're going to look at in the next two problems. So we have a multiple choice question here, which is how these are most likely going to be presented to you, um, where we want to know which of these equations could be part of this graph. So first, they all indicate an amplitude of 2, which I have. They all indicate a vertical shift of negative 1, which I have. And they all have the same period of pi. So the only distinguishing factors are the phase shift and the function. So whether it's a sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine. So I'm going to run through these. Okay, This has a phase shift of negative pi over 4. 
and it's a cosine. So I'm gonna go back to negative pi over four, and what I'm looking for for a cosine is there to be a maximum there. There is not. Uh, if it was gonna be that first one, if I had a negative cosine, we would be in business, but since it's a positive, that one's not correct. Here I have a phase shift of positive pi over two. So if I go to pi over two, I'm looking for a sine graph here. This starts at the midline, however it goes down instead of going up. Just like the last one, if I plopped a negative in front of it, we'd be in business, uh, but we're not there. Here, we have a phase shift of pi. Okay, then we have a function sine, which we do have, okay, because it's at the midline moving up. Okay, but just to check this one, this would be a negative sign with no phase shift, and I don't. I have a positive sign with a, no phase shift there. All right. Next, I'm going to write four possible equations for this graph uh, with a sine, a negative sine, a cosine, and a negative cosine. Okay, no matter what the function is, the amplitude is going to be the same which for this one, let me be on the midline there, my amplitude is three. My period is not gonna change if I change the function, is gonna be two pi, which means my b is two pi over two pi, or one. And they all have the same vertical shift or midline of two. Okay, so what's gonna change my a value is going to be 3, my d is going to be, sorry, 2, uh, but then what will change is the phase shift. Okay, I'm actually going to do these in not this order. I'm going to start with the one that doesn't require a phase shift, cosine. Okay, if I don't have a phase shift, I can write this as a cosine just fine. So this will be g of theta. equals 3 cosine theta plus 2. Now you could just for the fun do a phase shift of 2 pi, um, but we don't need to. Okay. With a sign, I'm looking for my midline and then going up. So I could choose this point or I could choose this point, either one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do this one. So all the other pieces are the same except our phase shift. This one has a phase shift of negative pi over 2, so that's going to make this plus pi over 2. Uh, but alternatively, I could have done 3 pi over 2, which would make that a minus 3 pi over 2. For a negative sign, I want to start at the midline going down. So I'm going to have a phase shift of pi over 2. negative 3 sine theta minus pi over 2 plus 2. I forgot my plus 2. Okay, finally a negative cosine. We want to start at a minimum, so I'm going to choose this, which means I have a phase shift of pi, which in my equation will be a minus now, if we didn't have a phase shift or a B value of one, we need to make sure those phase shifts were in parentheses, uh, but that's how we can handle different phase shifts um, on our graph. In topic 3.7, uh, we're taking all this sinusoidal stuff and applying it to real life situations. Okay, so our first one here, the temperature per hour during the day can be modeled by a sinusoidal function. The low temperature of 23 degrees Fahrenheit for the day occurred at 6 a.m. The high temperature, occurred at 50 of 57 degrees occurred at noon. The function uh, t of t equals a sine b quantity t plus c plus d uh, can be used to model the temperature during the day. What are the values for a and d? Well that's going to be our vertical shift and our amplitude. So I don't need a whole fancy graph. I have a high temperature of 57 and a low temperature of 23. So my a is my amplitude. Okay, I'm going to take 57 
minus 23 and divide that by 2. Okay, so this distance is 17 and this distance is 17. For my D options, I can take 23, add 17. I can take 57, subtract 17 or I can find the average of those two values. All of those will get you the same thing of 40. Okay. A wooden horse on a merry-go-round moves up and down as the ride is moving. It takes 1.5, the horse 1.5 seconds to complete one cycle. When the horse is at its highest, the nose is five feet from the platform. The low point, the nose is only two feet above the platform. Uh, we have our function that can be used to model the distance between the nose of the horse and the platform. What are the values of A, B, and D? Okay, my A is going to be 5 minus 2 over 2, 3 halves, or 1.5. My D is going to be the average of 5 and 2. And then my B comes from the period. It takes 1.5 seconds to complete one cycle, which means my B is 2 pi over 1.5, which would be 2 pi or 4 pi over 3. To get that decimal not to be in the denominator. Last problem we're going to go over is a mirror. Um, of what you're going to see for free response question three. Okay, it's always going to be a sinusoidal function in a real life situation. It will always be no calculator uh, and it will always have the following three parts. You'll be labeling five points on a graph and it will be this graph. Okay, from that you're always going to be writing an equation. Now this may be sine, it may be cosine, uh, and then you're going to be identifying some characteristics on the graph. So let's read our scenario. Okay, a pirate ship ride completes one cycle every five seconds. Point B is on the end of the boat as pictured above. At T equals zero seconds, point B is at its highest position, 20 feet above the ground. When point B is at its lowest position, it is five feet above the ground. The ship swings at a constant speed. Uh, the distance between point B and the ground periodically, increase, periodically increases and decreases. Uh, the sinusoidal function h models the distance between point b and the ground. Okay, so at its highest, we're 20 feet away. When it gets down to its lowest here, it's going to be 5. Uh, and it takes 1.5, sorry, 5 seconds to repeat one cycle. Uh, so I'm going to graph this just off to the side. Or you can just label everything on yours. I just kind of like to see the physical thing. So we have 5, 20, 1.5. So my graph is going to start at 20, go down, and back up. Okay. If this is, sorry, not 1.5. Oh, I have 1.5 in my head. 5 seconds to repeat itself. Okay, that means its halfway point here is going to be at 2.5. This will be half of that, or 1.25. So 1.25 plus 1.25 is 2.5, and then if I add another 1.5, we have 3.75. Uh, this line is going to be the average of 20 and 5, which is half of 25, or 12.5. Okay, so we can transfer that information directly to my graph here. My highest point will be 20, my midline will be 12.5, my minimum can be 5. Okay, for my times, I'm starting at a maximum and ending at a maximum, so that's good news. Uh, that means this is 0, this is 1.25, this is 2.5, 3.75, and 5. Now this could you know, had it started at a minimum, um, then we would ha have to extend the graph uh, in order to get two maximums. But you always need to be able to find two maximums and the three points in between them. So here, my coordinates for F are 0, 20. My coordinates for G 
are going to be 1.25, 12.5. J is going to be 2.5 down at the low of 5. And then we're going to go back up to K. Back up at 12.5. And then P is 5 and 20. We're now going to take that and turn it into an equation. Now this asks for the values for A, B, C, and D. Um, so let's go through that. My A is my amplitude. Okay, we're going from uh, 20 down to 12.5 or 5 up to 7.5 so that A value is 7.5. Okay, now that's assuming we're going to do a positive sine function. If it was a negative, then that would be switched, but we'll talk about that. Okay, my B, my period is 5, which means my B is 2 pi over 5. I'm going to come back to C last. D is my vertical shift of 12.5. I'm going to talk about two options for C that would make this a positive sign. I think it's easier to do that way. Okay, and your two possible shifts would be either here or here, because that's at the midline going up. Now you could use G as your phase shift, but then you need to make your A a negative. So to avoid that, I'm just gonna keep it positive and pick either this or this. So let me go through either. Okay, if my phase shift is a positive 3.75. That means my C would be minus 3.75. If my phase shift is this one, which would be a negative 1.25, which means my C would be a positive 1.25. Either of them work. I would not do two on your AP exam. Uh, pick one. I typically pick the positive one, but there's no rhyme or reason why one is better than the other. So my four values, A, B, D, let's just circle that. Okay. Next we're talking about an interval. Uh, it says the t-coordinate of K is T1 and the t-coordinate of P is T2. So we're looking at that little part of our graph. Okay. First question is, is it positive, negative, increasing, or decreasing? The positive and negative is referring to our output values. Are your output values positive or negative? In our case, they are positive. Okay, and is it increasing or decreasing? Our function is increasing here. And then finally, describe how the rate of change is changing on the interval T1, T2. So you just need to understand concavity. This is concave down. So since H is concave down on T1, T2, the rate of change is decreasing. This is really easy. Our other option is if it was a different interval and our graph was concave up, then our rate of change would be increasing. On those rate easy points on your AP exam, so uh, go get those. Uh, so that was uh, AP Precalculus Topics 3.1 through 3.7. Thank you for watching.